Corinthians, uh, what we will be covering isn't far off from what we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks. And so we will be in James chapter 1 today. Um, If you want to go ahead and turn there. Now, one of my goals, uh, one of my personal goals uh, for this last year was I wanted to read more. Um, On average, I want to be able to read about a book a week, um, which thankfully audiobooks exist, or I would be very behind at this point. Um, One book that that I've been spending a a lot of time with recently is is pretty much an introduction to philosophy book. Um, I'm not very smart, so I, have to, I need the intro books. Um, it covers different topics. It, it has different essays. Uh, for example, one is talking about why do we, when we are watching TV or, or experiencing diff- different things, why do we have these emotions about things that don't exist? So a, a common example would be like horror movies. Like you're watching a horror movie, it's building suspense, and you feel it, even though you know nothing's going to come out of your TV, Right? Um, I think that probably points to not relying on your emotions, especially, which is very applicable for us when we follow Jesus. But one essay that that really stood out to me um, is this idea of purpose. That's an idea that everyone has uh, within them at at some point in their life, is what is my purpose in life? Um, if, you're, if you graduate high school, you're, you're, you're graduating looking for your purpose. College students, you've probably asked that. What is my purpose? I'm trying to find my purpose. Well, uh, turns out <clears throat> that idea uh, was really focused on in philosophy um, one, by one person specifically uh, in the book named Jean-Paul, I'm going to butcher her. I think it's French, Sartre, Sartre, or something like that. Um, it's really interesting. He, he comes up with this idea that existence precedes essence. Meaning, in other words, you existed, you, you, you came into existence, and now you find your meaning in life. Well, unfortunately, um, that's a very anti-God way of looking at life. Uh, in fact, Jean-Paul states that God is dead. And so as you try to find your own purpose in life, you are actually making yourself out to be God. It would be like you, you making this hammer and then the hammer being like, I'm going to see what I can be. Hammer's a hammer. <laughs> and God makes it very clear in his word why we were created. Take, for example, Isaiah 43:7. God says, everyone who is called by my name and whom I created for my glory. So right there, your purpose in life is to glorify God. That is why you were created. Even our mission, God makes it very clear what our mission in life is. We have it on the wall behind us right here. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So our mission is to make disciples. It's even implied, it's implied in that verse that you are to be a disciple. And so your purpose, if it goes beyond any of those two things, in reality, you're siding with Sean Paul who says, God is dead. I am my own God. Thankfully, uh, I don't think anyone in here would agree with him, um, at least not outright, right? Like functionally, uh, we all try to be God, otherwise we wouldn't sin, right? But if our purpose is to glorify God by making disciples, then what does that even look like? What does that look like to go and make disciples? What does it look like in everyday life to glorify him and that's a, a question that, that should logically stem from our purpose. And it's a question that divides churches all the time. Um, it's one that has uh, caused some to even look like they've uh, left the Orthodox faith. And that's because what happens when we ask even that question, what does it look like for me to glorify God? It is very tempting to pick and choose 
and be God myself, even, even in that. And so, again, God makes it very clear in Scripture even what it means to glorify him. And what we'll see today is what God has to say about what this religion looks like that has this purpose of glorifying him and making disciples. And we'll see how this new ministry to, fa- to fatherless boys, how that connects to our purpose and to our mission. And so um, we, we will be in James chapter 1, starting in verse 21. Uh, but before I read, uh, I, let's go ahead and, and pray. <clears throat> Father, I thank you for your word. I pray that as we look at it, that you open our hearts and our minds to your word, um, that your spirit will convict us um, and and help us to see what it looks like to glorify you. Uh, Give us the the faith to go and and live according to your word. And it's in your son's name I pray. Amen. So starting in verse 21, James says, Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, In humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. So there's this phrase in this verse that that James covers throughout multiple verses, if if you were to look at this in uh, in context. Um, The word is word. We see it right there in verse 21. What is the word? Again, he, he talks about it in verse 21. If you jump ahead in verse 25, there's this phrase that, that James uses called the law of liberty. And, and, and those two are, are connected. James is continuing his train of thought. And even if you go back to verse 18, James talks about the word of truth. So what is this word? Is it uh, the Bible? What, what is this? Well, a key, a key phrase in verse 21 is that James says, is able to save your souls. So does just reading the Bible save us? Does just obeying some command save us? No. So, so this is, first off, talking about the gospel, the word that, uh, of the gospel, hearing the gospel. It's the only way to be saved. So Jesus, through his life, his death, his resurrection, he bore the wrath for your sins, so that you could have a relationship with God. And he came back to life, proving all of his promises and commands are true. We don't do anything, we don't earn anything, and we put our faith in that. We bet our life on that. So this is the gospel But there is a wider meaning, a wider understanding to this. It's not just believing some truths about Jesus. It's it's also talking about the totality of Scripture. Again, law of liberty is connected to this phrase right here uh, in verse 21. And so when we hear the law, what usually comes to our mind when we hear law in the context of of Scripture? The Old Testament, right? Right. so it brings to mind that. But notice that this word is implanted in verse 21. So it's not just external. We're not just hearing it. It's saying that this word is implanted. And that is a intentional on James's part. He's getting that from Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 33. God says, But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declared the Lord. I will put my law within them and on their heart I will write it and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And so this is the implanting of the word through faith. God is making this covenant with man which is through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And through that we have this covenant. We have this relationship with Jesus. You know, and this is where it's very, a very similar idea to what we covered in 2 Corinthians just last week. If you remember in 2 Corinthians, we, we talked about how the gospel changes our desires. It changes our motivations. But then those desires, those uh, motivations should lead to transformed hands, as we said. 
So, and so the example last week was Jesus being the ultimate example of generosity should lead to us going and being generous as well. And so in going back to James, through the gospel, God lives in us, his word is in us, and as a result, we, as, as this verse says, we put aside all filthiness and wickedness that remains. It's that same concept, that same idea. Transformed hearts from the gospel leads to transformed hands. Um, so there's turning away from sin in, in just this one verse. Now, James, he, he doesn't really just end there, okay? He, he puts added weight to this idea of transformed hands. Um, in verse 22, <clears throat> He says, but prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. So James, he has a, a thesis uh, statement, I guess you could say, in this verse. Okay? He says, the only proper response to God's word is to obey it. Okay? And, and you notice that he says, prove yourself. So we're, there's this proving that, that's going on here. Now, notice that that's in contrast to these that are just merely hearers. Now, real quick, what that's not saying is that you're not supposed to listen to God's word, you're not supposed to read God's word, you're not supposed to memorize God's word. That's not what James is saying. But what he is saying in, in, in the context of proving is that those that just hear that just read, that just know scripture, if they do nothing, then they are deluded. They are deluded in thinking that they even have the word in them. Again, who is James' audience for those that know? Believers. He's not talking to unbelievers right now. He's not saying respond to the gospel and receive salvation. He's talking to believers and saying, you know these things. You've been transformed. You have these desires. It should manifest if it's genuine. What he's saying is obedience to God's word is the only response for those that have received the gospel. Obedience to God's word is the only response for those that have received the gospel. We, we talked about the heart transform, transformation last week. That is important. Um, but if it just ends there, then there has to be this question as to whether or not we truly receive salvation. And I, I put an illustration at this point, but um, James gives us one in verses 23 and 24. He says, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. <clears throat> so James is saying, if, if you're only hearing, you're not responding, you're not obeying, you're like a person that's looking at a mirror and instantly forgetting what you look like. He's pointing out how foolish it is to not respond to God's word. Um, so think of it this way. Well, we'll, we'll stay within the context of, of James's example here. Let's say you have a, a very important job interview. Like you need that money. And so you're, you're, you're preparing, you're, you're having these questions, uh, practice that, that you're running through. You're making sure that your hair looks nice, if, if you have hair. Um, you're making sure you, you look nice, everything like that. But then you look in the mirror right before you go in and you notice that you have this big thing of broccoli in your teeth. <laughs> but instead of brushing your teeth, you just go ahead and go into that interview. Common sense in that instance would say, you're going to brush your teeth. Or at least pick it out, right? <laughs> Common sense when... God's word says something or shows something, common sense would be to respond to it, would be to obey it. Jesus did not just die for you to have a happy life knowing that you're not going to hell. 
He died so that he would be your ultimate authority, so that he would be in the correct place in your life as king. And there's, there's benefits to it, and we'll talk about some of the promises here in a second. But when we respond to God, we are, by faith, saying we believe that God is our ultimate authority. And it's common sense to respond in that way. In verse 25, he says, but one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. So real quick, notice how, what what James says about how we interact or, or respond to God's word. He doesn't say that you just glance at it. Notice he doesn't say you just hear it for about 30 minutes a week. He says you look at it intently. In fact, he, he goes even further by saying that it uh, abide by it, that you abide by it. Now, that's a word abide, abiding that, that we probably have heard a lot, especially from it seems like college students that have gone overseas. They, they learn that concept uh, pretty well and then bring it back to them. Um, but it, it, it seems as if for us, there can be a little bit of confusion as w- to what abiding means, um, or, or at least vague, maybe. <clears throat> John, the book of, like, in First John, loves talking about abiding. He uses it, this word a lot. And so sometimes we think that abiding in Christ means just reading the Bible sometimes. Maybe just praying sometimes. Being reliant on God. All those things are true. But what is the context of James' usage of it? See, abiding is not just reading and praying. It is also living or doing God's word. Living by God's word. And notice the promise that James has here at at the end of this verse. This man will be blessed in what he does. Do do you hear that promise? You can actually be blessed. Now, that doesn't mean that your life will be easy, that you'll have a prosperous life or have riches or anything like that. But there is this promise of a blessed life when abiding by God's word. And this is where it's important to see that that James ties it to what he calls the law of liberty. Some translations that says the law of freedom. That, that, That those are almost two opposing views right here. And again, when we hear law, what do we think of? What do we hear when we hear the word law in the context of the Bible? The Old Testament commands, right? The Old Testament commands that showed our need for a Savior, that that could not justify us, no matter how much we tried. But people had, had tried. But the weight of sin, the weight of failure with those things produced no transformation, produced no salvation. But that with the gospel, with Jesus fulfilling the commands perfectly, you now get to live within this realm of what God intended in creation. You get to obey him, not because you need to, to be saved, to be made right, to come before him. But now you get to. You know, uh, back when I was in college, there was always this, like, oh, man, I have to go do my homework right now. Um, in reality, there's a lot of people that would love to go to college, go to high school, do, learn a lot of things. But here in America, it's, it's not really a have to. No one ha- is, has a gun to your head making you go to school right now. It really is a privilege. You get to do those things. When it comes to being in God's word, knowing God's word, and obeying God's word, it is not a burden for us. Remember, Jesus says, my burden is light. Rather, this is a life of freedom. 
you are free to go and obey the Lord. You are free to oh, uh, glorify God by obeying him in, in, in every aspect of your life without the weight of sin, without the weight of death hovering over you. Obedience to God's word is the only response for those that have truly received the gospel. Again, the idea of transformed hands leads to transformed hearts. It's very clear within this. And so when it comes to all these desires, all these things that, that we see in scripture, it's not just knowing or desiring to share the gospel. It's going out and sharing the gospel. It's not just knowing your need to be discipled. It's going and being discipled. Do not merely know that you need to be obedient to the king. Go and obey him. Because you get to. Merely knowing the right thing is useless without the proper response. Um, J James, he even says that doing life that way is sin. He says, whoever knows the right thing to do but fails to do it, for him it is sin. Obedience is the only response. Now, <clears throat> even with this, uh, it's not super uh, specific, not uh, very clear as to what this obedient life looks like in the context of glorifying him and making disciples. Um, in fact, I, I'd argue you see that all over the church, <laughs> throughout the country, throughout the world, of picking and choosing what this looks like. And so God has these very plain commands in Scripture about uh, mission, sexuality, so on, and uh, there seems to be this picking and choosing uh, as to which ones are important. And that's the same issue that we've talked about earlier. That is, you, regardless of if you mean to or not, you are believing that you are still God in that instance. And James, seemingly focusing on some Old Testament commands, tells us what cannot be missed in our pursuit to know and glorify God in obedience. This religion that's characterized by obedience, what does it look like? And James gives us three characteristics that are true in, this, in the disciples of Christ. He says in verse 26 and 27, if anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. <clears throat> What's interesting is you see that word religion there. So what do you know? It's not, it's not a bad thing to call this a religion, right? Um, relationship is fine. We are in a relationship. But the idea here is, is that we do practice our faith, Okay? We're not just this emotional beings that, that have this one-on-one -on -one time with God. We are to respond in some way. And when it comes to this verse, John Calvin says that James does not define generally what religion is, but reminds us that religion without these things he mentions is nothing. So in other words, this is an, uh, an exhaustive list of what it looks like to be a follower of Christ but the true followers of Christ will not get these three things wrong. Okay, so the first one, and we're not going to go deep into all of them um, for time's sake, but um, for your own uh, sanctification, we'll, we'll talk about them a little bit. So the first thing is, as he mentions, is if anyone thinks himself to be religious yet does not bridle his tongue, that man's religion is worthless. So the first thing is the taming of the tongue. And James, he, he goes into more detail about why that is in chapter 3. But some things he, he points out is from the tongue comes blessings and curses. It, it's, a, it's a small part of the body, but it can cause big damage in, in, in the world, right? The first thing is, is this idea of taming the tongue. But he also says will keep themselves unstained by the world. We talked about this already in verse 21. We are in this world. God has not taken us out of it. 
And he's done so so that we can glorify him, so that we can live for him. But as we do that, we are not conformed to this world. This is Romans 12. It talks about what our spiritual worship is. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. True disciples of Jesus are not stained by this world. And, you know, there's this progressive transformation. I do want to point that out. You're not perfect, but you're not seeking to stay part of, of how this world flows. So taming of the tongue, unstained by the world. And then finally he says, <clears throat> visit orphans and widows in their distress. And, and this is the emphasis for today, right? Now, the Old Testament has, has many commands for what are kind of generally termed as those that are helpless, those that um, can be taken advantage of, those that when it comes to life, it's going to be very difficult for them to survive. In the Old Testament, those were widows and those were orphans. And Listen to, to some Old Testament texts about what, what, what this looks like. <clears throat> in Exodus 22, verse 22, God says, Do not take advantage of a widow or an orphan. Deuteronomy 14, verse 29, God says, To provide for widows and orphans. Isaiah 1, verses 10, Seek justice, encourage the oppressed, defend the cause of the fatherless, plead the cause of the widow. And this is how God views himself in all of this. In Psalm 68, verse 5, God is a father to the fatherless and defender of widows. Obedience is the only response for those that have truly received the gospel. And, you know, these are people that, that historically are, are try not to say certain words that uh, trigger me, um, these are people that, that historically are, are helpless, that have, uh, have a disadvantage in life. But here's the reality. Think about how this reflects the gospel. Think about how that, uh, uh, the, gospel ha the reality of the gospel has affected our lives. Those that needed help from God for their salvation help those that are in need of help. This is a, a beautiful reflection of the gospel. We were totally helpless in our sin. There was nothing we could do to get us out. Our sinful nature put us at the most extreme disadvantage. But God still adopted us. He still came down and brought us into his family. Today, you're, there's going to be a lot of opportunities to obey God in, in, in what this true and undefiled religion looks like. And remember, as you hear those opportunities, if you've received the gospel, you, you need to consider how you will obey. <clears throat> and so that's one thing to remember, but also... As you hear about all these opportunities, remember that this is still an act of faith. In, in Romans 14, verse 23, uh, Paul makes it very clear that whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. And so what, what that looks like is, you know, there's a need on campus for someone to go and share the gospel uh, on campus, to make disciples on campus. Not every single person in here can do that. Not every single person should uh, change their schedule, change their resources, their time, energy to go on campus. And if that's not you and you try to do that, according to Romans, that is sin. And so what that means for us today is that not every single person in here will have a direct engagement with this ministry to fatherless boys. In some practical aspects, that's not that won't, wouldn't even be wise. But everyone should be involved in some way, right? And so the way that I, I, I'll put it for, for you this morning is kind of the same way that missions puts, puts it out there. 
there are three ways to engage this ministry today. The first one is to pray. We believe that God's the one that changes hearts, changes minds, transforms. Pray for the boys. Pray for the single mothers. And pray for the workers. The workers who are going to go and share the gospel and make disciples. The first way you can be involved today is pray. The second way is to give. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the reality in life is things cost money. That's just how it goes. Um, but as we saw last week, or, or I can't remember if it was last week or the week before, when it comes to our giving, our generosity, that's not saying, hey, you are doing the work, I'm not doing anything. It is still a way of partnering in the ministry. Like that, There's going to be people that are going to be spending their time, energy, and resources, and you can bless them by helping them not have to cover certain costs. You can pray, you can give, and then, of course, you can go. You can go and share the gospel. You can go and mentor people. You can go and, and be an agent of healing because God's the one, God is the God of all comforts and he uses people, right? And you can go and make disciples. Those that needed help from God for their salvation, we go and help other people. We go and help those in need of help. We live in a town where you can see uh, the need of this, this need everywhere, right? Some in here, you probably even have experienced the result of a broken household in this way, right? God has made it clear in his word what your purpose is. And he has told you what it looks like to carry out your purpose. The choice for you today is either faith or delusion obedience or disobedience. And so, obedience to God's word is the only response for those that have truly received the gospel. So who will be your God? Let us be a people that know, follow, and share Christ in the, this way, according to God's word. So, in, what we'll do now is, uh, instead of just going straight to singing, we're actually going to spend time praying. Um, we believe that, again, that God's the one that draws people to him. He's the one that changes people. Um, and so we're, we, we need him for this ministry. And so um, we're going to split this into three sections. Uh, we're going to pray for the boys. We're going to pray for the single mothers. And then we're going to pray for the workers. And so um, here in a second, you're going to pray for the boys. Again, this is not a situation that God created. This is a, an aspect of, of sin and, and suffering that, that just happens in this world. Pray for healing for these boys. 